Good morning. It's good to see you today and to be able to just open God's Word with you for a few moments. I know that many of us are looking forward, I think all of us are looking forward to the spring break, and, uh, and I do echo what Dr. Clem said a few moments earlier, that we would consider uh, safety and uh, our lives with God. You know, one of the things that uh, I have been uh, finding in a trend, and in my own life, uh, that I would like to speak on this morning um, is really God's Word. God's Word in our life and how it can affect us I think with the students that God has given me the privilege to meet with this semester, I would say, uh, and, and that's quite a few, I would say 95 to 99% have said that if there's anything I could pray for them personally about, it is their time with God. Uh, that I, I don't make the time, sometimes I fall away from reading the Word of God, my, my devotional time is... Um, minimal, and as a Christian, I know I need to be submitting myself to the joys of knowing God through His Word, but I'm struggling with it. And this morning, as we open up Psalm 119 together, this is what struck me as I began to look at this, because I stand before you as somebody who has struggled in seasons of my life with searching out and getting the blessing of knowing God's Word daily. And so I want to encourage you for next week and encourage you in your Christian life now to look at and to say, God, I need to make commitments to you to understand your word more thoroughly and enjoy you more and more. When we go on vacation sometimes, one of the things that's interesting in my life is that I tend to drop out of my daily routine. And if I have God as a part of my daily routine, I need to be careful and keep my guard up on vacation so that I take that time to see who God is in my life and what he has done. So we're going to look into the word of God. What does it mean to meditate? You know, we could go to a lot of verses today, and many of you could quote some of these verses with me. You could go to Psalm chapter 1 where it says, um, But his delight is in the law of the Lord... And in his law doth he meditate, how often? Day and night. See, we know these verses. Psalm 19 says that the word of God is like honey from the honeycomb. It's, it, to the person that's seeking the taste of who God is, it's like eating honey. Uh, we could go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and we could explore the inspiration of God. All scripture is God-breathed. It is God's direct breathing into our lives, the revelation of himself so we could know him better. And, and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction of, in righteousness. Now remember, it's good to remember in 2 Timothy 3 that we have the word of God, that the person of God would be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So God's word teaches me how to live. And so when I started looking at this for my own life and saying, how do I see God's word? And, and, and when I fall into my times of not spending relevant time with God, non-distracted time with God, when my phone isn't bothering me, when my studies aren't overwhelming me, when I go to church and I'm supposed to be there worshiping God and my mind is distracted so much that I'm not even concentrating, and by the way, possibly even distracting somebody who needs to meet the Savior that day. Why is it? So how do I train my mind? We could easily look back into the authors of the Psalms and we could say, well, they didn't have the distractions that we did of the day. They didn't have the technology that we have. Uh, I was noticing with another student walking over, kind of made us kind of chuckle together, but uh, we were noticing how many people were checking their phones and walking, and I said, my statement is this, um, I can't walk and check at the same time I usually trip. And I fall over and, and because I'm just so, I'm off balance all the time. So how do I concentrate on God's word? And that's why I would like for us today to look at 
Five different times the word meditate is used in Psalm 119. If you are reading the Psalms, pretty soon you're going to read Psalm 119, 176 verses. It's a lot to take in. And when, and when you look at the word and, and some of the exploration of Psalm 119 today, I think this is going to encourage your heart if you are seeking to taste God. And I realize this morning that some of you are absolutely not in the mindset to taste God. Your mind is already distracted. Your mind is already gone. And what, I, what I'm trying to hone in on my life is the ability to center in on who God is and concentrate on His goodness so I can rejoice in that. That is different than knowledge. That is different than taking a test. This is a, this is a relationship I'm trying to taste and see that the Lord is good. And so I'm going to hopefully help each one of us as we walk through this today and uh, understand it a little bit. So what does meditate mean? I don't have this in my notes, but I'll go to notes in a few moments. What does meditate? It means to consider. It means to consider. It, at times it means this way, to mumble. Or have you ever said something or you noticed somebody said something to you and they made you think and you go, hmm. A couple, maybe 10 years ago, there used to be a commercial or, or at least an ad campaign that people would say things that make you go, hmm, to think about, to consider. So five times in Psalm 119, we have a, ver a word called meditate that says it makes you consider. So I, I tried to see in my own life times when I do this. One time was last night when I was filling out my brackets for the March Madness. Is it going to be Gonzaga, Indiana? Is it going to be Duke? And I get down to who I pick for my, my, my final two, and guess what I'm doing? I'm considering. I'm meditating on my guess. I'm going, hmm, it can't be Liberty anymore, so who is it now? You, you know what I'm saying? We, we meditate a lot. Have you ever been in a class, and hopefully you have in your past three or four years, but have you ever been in a class and you heard some information that for the first time you heard it and you went, hmm. At that moment, you're considering and you're stopping and you're contemplating what is being said and you're thinking through it. So let's look at some of the notes because these are the things that stop us. And, and I'd like to give for us today in our notes uh, really, what is Psalm 119 about? I didn't do point by point um, in case you're taking notes today, but Psalm 119, 176 verses, only five of them do not clearly talk about God's Word. So as you build up to reading Psalm 119, you can look at it and you can clearly state that there, there the psalmist is emphasizing God's Word to me. And in his life, how did it operate and what were the blessings of it? The author is thought to be, by many, to be David. But we do not know. But we do know this about his life because in, in, the, in the psalm it says this, that he was relatively young, or the author was relatively young, mature enough to speak God's word, and they were undergoing persecution in their life. So in the context of what Psalm 119 was about, it was a thirst in the persecution. In, in youth, I need to see God. I want to sense God. I want to have a communion with God. And at the same time, I want to be able to speak the truth of God in my life. And because of that, through the persecutions of my life, I want to be able to give a thorough, authoritative answer to what guides me in my life. And that is God's Word. That's why the emphasis is there. And another thing of introduction is this, the descriptions of God's Word. I don't know how big this is, so I'm sorry if it's small. I can send you the notes if you'd like me to. But li listen to the descriptors of God's law or God's Word. And you'll see sometimes the same translation into English is used but it has a different meaning. Like when we see in the New Testament, love. Is it agape? Is it eros? Is it phileo? These are the different words that are used in Psalm 119 for God's Word. The law, which means the standards of God's Word revealed. The Word, which stresses the action of God's communication to mankind. God breathed 
the Word, His action to mankind, the testimony of the Lord, the certainty of the righteousness of God's Word. In other words, we would say it this way, what God says is true. The testimony of the Lord. The judgment or ordinances of the Lord. The legal basis of God's standards because of His justice. The statutes of the Lord, we could say, are pure. It means to cut or to engrave like a headstone on a graveyard or a grave plot, uh, suggesting permanence. The commandments of the Lord, the authority of God's Word, I command you because I am God. The precepts of the Lord, care and concern in the restrictions imposed on mankind. When I read that definition, I had to take pause and think, and I hope you do too. Remember this, the commandments of the Lord are not grievous. They're for our good. The commandments that God has given you as a believer are to be to help us have a spiritually successful life. That is good. So the precepts of the Lord are not imposed on man mankind for our hurt. They are imposed on mankind for our good. That's great. Then it's used, the word is used again. Not the action of God's word, but the content of His word. So the word in action, it's me giving the word, the word in its content. The way, and this is mentioned twice, a way to be followed. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The way that I follow, the, the, the steps I take in direction of my life. Lastly, this word's only used once in this psalm, but it's a path or a way of life. The road that God wants us to travel. So we see a desire and a care from God in Psalm 119 to help me consider and meditate, to help me stop and pause when I see about these things in my life that are pertinent and go, hmm, this is what God is trying to teach me. I need to consider this. So you say, what, when we look at these things to consider, what are, is the real what is the real impact that this will make on my life? We live such busy lives today that I will not enjoy God unless I make a concerted effort to enjoy Him. Student, you will not enjoy God unless you make a concerted effort to enjoy Him. Millions of people know about God. I wonder how many people enjoy God. Think about your worship experience on Sunday. Did you enjoy the character of God that day? Or did you walk away with a series of notes from a great person who probably spoke expositorily on a passage and it made no impact about the character of your God in your life? We need to make a commitment to stop and consider. And that's what the psalmist does. So I'm going to ask you today to consider five things in your life. Consider five things that the Word of God is greater than. And these are the things that are mentioned. The fifth one's on the next slide. First thing is this, and I'm going to ask you to look at the Word of God with me. It is the way that we understand. It is His truth, and I hope that this helps you in your devotional life next week and even today. So the first thing comes from verses 14 and 15. The Scripture says this, In the way of your testimonies I delight, as much as in all riches... I will meditate, I will consider, I will go, hmm, on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, I will not forget your word. Now go up with me just a couple of thing, uh, verses here. Uh, he talks about earlier um, the idea that people around him are enjoying riches in verse 14. I delight as much as in all riches. So considering the word of God is greater than seeking for material gain. 
It's very interesting to look at the way the world is going with material gain. I, I love to watch sports and I love interesting facts about sports. There was a documentary that came out, and many of you have probably seen it, called Broke on 30 for 30 by ESPN. The statistics are staggering that 85% of professional football players are bankrupt less than three years after they are out of the professional league. Isn't that interesting to you? That in the time that they sign multi-million dollar contracts, within the time of their career, they basically owe money for the rest of their lives. And we look at our lives today and we say that money comes and money goes. That's a true statement. Every time I think I have a little bit of savings, something goes wrong. Isn't that the way it is with your life? Every time I think I'm doing okay financially, all of a sudden it's gone. It's probably because God knows I can't handle my finances well enough to have a lot. But God's Word should be more important, and I should consider His Word much more than thinking about how I can gain riches. See, the psalmist makes it very clear. He says, in the way of your testimonies I delight. I will consider all on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. God does not want me to concentrate on my vocation in life and what the end goal is going to be for the net income that I bring home. All part of God's plan, all part of the needs He provides. But what is sweeter than the paycheck is God's precepts. It's greater than money. Consider that. Consider. That's what the psalmist did. He stopped and said, it's not about the money. Go to verses 21 and 23. It says, you rebuke the insolent, accursed ones. You wander from your... Uh, you who wander from your commandments, take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. And this is where he says to consider, even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. So considering God's word is greater than human advisors. In my time of need, in my time of pressure, in my time when life seems overwhelming, what is going to make the greatest impact in my life? I need to make sure that I understand and prioritize correctly, but from the psalmist's view, it was not the mentors, it was not my key discipler, it was not the person that had made the most impact in my life. The thing that would make the most impact and make me consider the most and that is greater than all of human advisors would be this. God's Word. God's Word. That's what affects my life. That's what changes my thinking. That's what sets my course. God's Word. God's Word. He has given God's Word to us to be able to consider. And in this case, you have an, adver an adversarial circumstance going on. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. In this case, the psalmist is saying, I am living for God, but there are people around me who make fun of me for doing that, and, and they scorn me, and they don't understand why I do that. And the psalmist came to a point in his life where he said, Following God's Word is greater than what people think about me following God's Word. Do you succumb to peer pressure? Do you care what people think? I do. But, we should be considering God's words much greater than what people say about us. And even the advice that we have. Third, 25 to 28. The verse says this, My soul clings to the dust. This is despairing. 
despondent. Give me life according to your word. Give me life. Breathe in me again, God. Let me sense your presence again. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. I'm your student today, God. Teach me your word. Melt my heart. And what does he say? Make me understand the way of your precepts. And I will meditate. I will consider. I will go, hmm, about all of your wondrous works. See, here's the the thing that we see here. Considering God's Word is greater than the stress and pressures of my life. When we see this in the context of the passage, the psalmist is writing and he's saying, I've got all these pressures. I've got all these stresses that are taking place. And, And many of you, which is very sad because of the sinful nature of the world we live in, many of you today may be looking at your week next week and some of you are going to enjoy it greatly but there is no doubt that some of you in this room will go home to a situation that will surprise you that will hurt you that will test your very soul it happens every year so some of you will have stress and tension. Some of you will be going on vacation and the worst thing you're going to have to think about is where you're going to go to eat that night. This psalmist said, I have stresses and pressures or stress and pressures in my life and when I consider, when I meditate on God's Word, it lets me remember His wondrous works to me. See, what is better than the stresses of my life? What is better than the anxiety that I carry? In my anxiety, in my stress, I can remember God and His wondrous works. I can remember what He's done for me. I mean, the Scriptures say, and I believe it's in the Psalm, let the redeemed of the Lord, seven times a day I will praise the Lord. Do you have seven things right now that you could praise God for in your life that you would call wondrous works? The Word of God helps us to consider the awesome majesty of the works that God has done in our lives. Are you discouraged today? Think about God's work. You say, I don't know how I'm going to make it next year. The finances aren't there. God will find a way. And I don't know His sovereign plan for you, but think about the wondrous work of God in your life right now. Has God saved you? You say, well, I'm gonna, I'm, let's take down all of the other stuff about how He's provided. Let's, let's just take off everything except for redemption. Has God saved you? Think about His wondrous work. Has He redeemed you from the slavery of sin? Think about God's work. The psalmist says, when anxiety hits me, when stress is there, I'm going to think about your wondrous works. Man, you got to love that you got to let it sink in a little bit. Four, considering God's Word is greater than all my opposition in life. Verses 44 to 48, the Scripture says this, I will keep your law continually. Don't you like what he says here? Forever and ever. What a commitment. He He was a sinner. But he said, forever and ever, God, I'm making the commitment to you. And I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. He made the decision in his life. If my opposition is in front of kings, I'm going to talk about God. I'm going to talk about and take the opportunity of who he is to speak that. Verse 47, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I love your word, God. I love what you have spoken to me. And here's what he meditates on. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. The picture is this. I love to worship the character of my God. He says, I will lift my hands toward your commandments, which I love. I don't know about you, but if if you're taking the time this morning to concentrate on what God has for you from His Word, there is nothing we can do as the redeemed but to worship Jehovah. There's nothing we can do. 
He is such a delight. He is such a gracious God. He is so good to each one of us. And he says, I will lift my hands towards your commandments. That is what I'm going to do. An interesting note here is that we've been seeing the word over and over again of delight. And that word delight means this, to kiss toward. At least in Psalm 1 it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. It means to kiss toward. My delight, my affection, is to kiss toward the character of God which I see in his word. And the psalmist says it over and over again. My affection is towards God's precepts. My affection is towards God's testimonies. My affection is towards His law. My affections are towards His judgment. And folks, in a world that we get distracted, sometimes my affections are towards my girlfriend when God's Word is being read. My affections are toward I like to play games. When God's Word is being spoken about, my affection is towards studying. When God's Word is being given, and the psalmist said, I love your commandments. I'm going to eat it up. I want it over and over again. And see, that's what builds character in a person's life when they say they know God. It's when everybody around them knows that the first priority is to live the character of God in front of others. That's what makes a strong person. It's God working through us, and I must lift my hands up. Look at this opposition, though. In his life, he was talking about answering to a king. And I'd like to give these five things very briefly. But in verse 44, he purposes to obey God's word. I will keep your law continually forever and ever. So you see, you, as we apply this, I must take on and personally. Okay, God, I need to take your principles today, and I need to obey them. So if I get angry, I'm not going to lose my temper. I'm going to give that to you. If I, if I get in an argument or a discussion with somebody, I'm going to speak truth in grace. I'm not going to try to win it for the sake of my pride. I must have freedom in the limit of God's word, or I have freedom. Verse 45, I shall walk in a wide place where I have sought your precepts. See, what the psalmist is saying here is that God's word is not constrictive or prohibitive. God's Word gives us the freedom to do what we know we ought to do. And that's freedom. Freedom isn't you can do whatever you want to do. Freedom is the ability to do what you know you ought to do. And God's Word teaches us what we ought to do. Love one another. Love God with all my heart. Simplistic in the words, but very deep in the meaning and how I apply it. I can speak God's ways without shame as we talked about how he talked to the kings. I can delight in God's word continually. I will worship the character of God through his word. And there's nothing greater. I, I'm going to challenge you to do something that may be very odd to you. But why don't you sit down next week and take a, a few moments to consider who God is and then write your own psalm. I don't know what that would look like to some of you, but is God worthy enough to take a few minutes and just say, maybe I'm not going to write it down because I never want people to read it, but God, this is what you mean to me. I'm not asking you to post it on the CCC website, on the CCC Facebook page. I'm asking you to consider God and go, hmm, he is good. Lord, I'm a junior and I've made it through this far. I cannot believe that you've provided for me this way. You are good. God, I remember when I came here, I was just so, had so many rough edges in my life, and you've chipped off those edges in my life, and you're making me more like Christ every day. God, you are good. God, I remember I came in and I filled on my application that I knew you. And by your grace, you struck my heart like a gentle sword that could only find the sin, and you saved my soul. You are good. You are good. Lastly, consider God's word 
and considering God's word as the greatest guide in my relationships. There's two relationships as you turn down to 76. Let the steadfast love comfort me, or your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let those who fear you turn to me, that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. Considering God's word is the greatest guide in my relationships. Let me ask you a question. Your parents recognize you today as somebody who loves the character of God. You say, well, I, my parents don't know Christ. I'm not asking that. You say, well, my parents know Christ, but they, they don't, we don't see eye to eye. The greatest thing to consider is that God's word is the guide in relationships. Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. And so he says, here's an adverse situation. And in that adversity, I'm going to use your word to give the answers of life. And then here's the blessing of those who like me. Let those who fear you turn to me. Those who want biblical advice, those who want to know God better, let them turn to me that they may know your testimonies. So the most intimate relationship that I'm talking about here today is those of you that have been engaged, that are getting ready to get married, you're counting down the days, it might be less than 80, it might be more than 100, and you can't wait to get married. What is the best thing you can give to your spouse? A relationship with a God who saved and redeemed you. What is the best thing you can give to your peers in your room? A relationship with the character of God. And say, in His Word I delight all of the time. All of the time. And he says in verse 80, May my heart be blameless in your statutes that I may not be put to shame. God, don't let me say I'm a lover of you. And people be able to look in my life and say, what? Don't let me be put to shame. When mom and dad ask me to do a simple thing, or grandpa and grandma, or whoever is overseeing my soul and my care at this time, don't ever let me be looked at by my teachers as somebody who is just totally disengaged. If, if I can use you, I'll use you. But if I don't need you, don't expect me to talk to you. Don't ever let me be thought of that way. But let me be seen as somebody who shows the character of God constantly. So in the time of trouble, when that brother or sister finds out that they are ill, in that time of trouble, when somebody in your immediate family is about to go through a divorce, that they would not see you as just a warm shoulder to lay their head on, but a person who will give them the comfort of God. Consider this. See, I'm supposed to be wrapped up so much, like the psalmist, wrapped up so much in the Word of God that if you put a spiritual needle in me, God's Word would come out. That's how much this psalmist loved God's Word. And I don't think that this is something that we can't say we can't move towards. I need to move towards this in my life. Will you commit to considering God's Word, meditating on it, things to consider, the character of God, His gracious acts towards you, His strength and care in your time of need. Sit back and consider God. Meditate. 